Awards. It is really an honor and a privilege for us. We would normally do our headlines at this time, but everything goes to the side when you have an opportunity to talk to Jack Nicholas, and he's with us. Mr. Nicholas, thank you very much for jumping on. Good morning, guys. Good morning, Jack. You know, it's it's when we get a chance to talk to people like yourself, you have so many interests going on. You're getting ready to go to Hawaii, playing something that you've done 21 times, 21 appearances in the Skins game. How are you budgeting time now with a clan that includes 20-plus grandchildren, not to mention all the interests with, uh, with the, the design business? How much competitive golf as far as preparation for competitive golf have you had leading into the Skins game? Well, virtually zero. <laughs> um, I did play a couple of days ago, and actually I'm actually going out and play this morning if the weather clears up. But uh, um, I, play, uh, I play about once a month. I don't ever hit any balls. And uh, actually I played uh, about, last, oh, about six weeks ago I played. With, uh, and I played so badly that I actually went out and hit balls the next two days because I said I, I just can't. This is so embarrassing that I just can't, I can't be this bad. How much would you like to play? Uh, probably less than that, uh, and, I, and I don't mean that from the standpoint that I don't like golf because I love golf. And what I mean is that I play so poorly that uh, it's just, you know, just, <laughs> I mean, if I break 80, I'm doing very well. You know, Jack, as far as the format, when they made the change in 2006, tell me how you felt about it then. Do you feel differently, and do you love it? Well, I probably would have played if they hadn't made the change because it's a uh, – uh, I don't think I've really played a complete round of golf since I finished at St. Andrews in 2005. And uh, it made the change, and then it allowed me to be able to play with Tom. And, uh, and I've had a lot of fun. I like the alternate shot. I think we've had a, we've had a blast. Of course, Tom and I won last year. We beat all those kids. <laughs> and uh, uh, we're going back out there and do it again this year. Now, this week they're at the Bob Hope Classic. You're certainly very familiar with this. What are your best memories from the Hope? Oh, let's see. The Hope Tournament, uh, let's see, I won it in 63. I beat Gary in a playoff. And uh, that's actually where I got uh, Angelo. That was uh, my caddy that caddied for me for so long. Uh, you know, I hurt my hip the week before, and I came to Palm Springs, and I didn't have a caddy. And, of course, you know, usually you just pick up somebody. And I, and I had a fellow there who was a friend of Angela's. He came up to me and said, hey, Jack, I've got the, your caddy who was assigned to you this week. I said, well, yeah, right. Because, you know, they didn't assign caddies in those days. It was just, you know, you, you found out what you wanted to do. And I said, I said oh, well, I'll try him. Well, anyway, Angelo caddied for me, and we, I won the golf tournament. Well, five of the next tur six tournaments that I had Angela, we won. So I said, well, I developed a relationship and uh, went on for for many, many years there, right there at Palm Springs. And and, of course, I think probably uh, uh, you guys talked about it earlier when I, I, I wore the blonde wig <laughs> at, uh, at Palm Springs. That was kind of a – Palm Springs used to be a lot of fun. We used to have all the celebrities came in there, the singers and the guys that you know, played the guitars and everything else. They came in and had a jam session uh, every day after the round, and then just had a lot of fun. And Arnold and I were together, and uh, uh, we uh, – I don't know, I think we went to the restroom and came back, and, and we brushed by this gal, and she must have been mortified because <laughs> – she had a, had a wig on it and brushed it and it fell off onto the floor. Well, I think I picked it up and put it on my head, and then Arnold picked it up and put it on his head. I'm not sure which way it worked out. And then we went out and danced and, and on the floor, and then we switched it around, and uh, one of us led and the other one led. It was kind of fun. Of course, it turned out to be a famous picture in Sports <laughs> Illustrated and so forth. But uh, uh, we had a lot of fun in those days. We did things that, uh, uh, you know, I don't expect to see a lot of today. But uh, uh, I guess the, the guys still have, their, have a lot of fun today, I'm sure. Jack Nicholas with us here on Morning Drive, and again next week out of the Champion Skins game, and he will be uh, making his donation to the Nicholas Children's Healthcare Foundation, which has raised over fifteen million dollars. And Jack, as far as the eighteen, you know, in the absence of Tiger's career, that probably today would be a mythical number, but it's a tangible number because he's at fourteen and you're at eighteen. When you got to 18, what did you think about the idea of anybody even approaching it, whether it be in your lifetime or ever? Well, I never thought about it one way or the other, to be very honest with you, because uh, 18 was just a number that it just happened it happened in that. Um, and I think from basically from the time I was 40 years old uh, to the time I was 50, I, I, I didn't really have anything else to do. I was doing my golf course design business, and I just went through the motions of playing golf. And uh, I really didn't prepare for it. And, of course, I think I 
caught lightning in a bottle in 86 at the Masters and, uh, you know, happened to win. But uh, for all intents and purposes, my career was over when I was 40 years old. And, uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't really have any goals. And you know, not that I uh, didn't enjoy playing, but that's probably why I still played. I kept my hand in. I played 12 or 14 tournaments a year. And uh, um, then when I got to be 50, I played, you know, I played a half a dozen senior tournaments and a half a dozen tournaments on the on the regular tour. I just kept my hand in the game of golf because I enjoyed playing. And I could still play a little bit, but uh, uh, I never really, I really worked at it like I should work at it. But, uh, you know, if had I known Tiger was coming along, maybe I'd work a little harder. But uh, uh, that's all right. I did what I did, and uh, he's doing what he's doing, and uh, we'll see what happens. You know, Jack, in the last couple of years, obviously, with what Tom almost did, and I know that you were, gosh, you were captive for what was going on at the British Open and Greg a couple years prior. People may forget 98. When they came on the air on Sunday, I almost fell out of my chair uh, because you were within a couple of shots uh, of the lead at the age of 58. Do you think, and I'm talking about the Masters in 1998, and you were 58 years old, do you think someone's going to win a regular tour event beyond 50 with the fitness craze and the, and the the shape that these guys are in? Do you think that that is very plausible now? Well, you know, you have to remember that the guys that are going to be 50 are the guys that came from being, being the guys that were in shape. Yeah. You know, we never, did, we never did any of that stuff when we were younger. You know, even football players didn't lift weights. And so... You know, it's a uh, it's a different it's a different deal today, and the guys are are fitter today. They uh, they're, they're larger, they're physically larger. I mean, you know, I've I've shrunk four inches now. I'm down. To, I'm I was six foot when I was playing. I'm down to five eight. And you know, when you're five eight, you don't have much of an arc anymore. Mm. And so, but a lot of, most of these guys out there are six three, six four, and you know, they're they, when they go to the senior tour, they still got a pretty good size arc, and they still got some pretty good club head speed, so they can still play golf. So yeah, I think it's very possible that uh, some of these guys. I mean, Tom almost won at age fifty nine, and uh, and and Tom is you know about my height, and so uh, you know it's uh, you get some of these big guys they can that, that keep themselves in shape. Yeah, I think it's very possible. Well, a lot of these arcs are at Abu Dhabi this week, uh, and that's certainly a, an impressive tournament and an impressive field. What do you think of guys golfing overseas and foregoing some of the traditional U.S. events like the Hope? Well, you know, it's a it's a sort of a win lose situation, I suppose, in many ways. Uh, it's a it's a win for the game of golf because they play around the world. They they create uh, uh, awareness of the game. They grow the game around the world. Yet it yet the U.S. Tour suffers a little bit from it. Um, you know, I don't know what's the right thing. I, I always felt like the game should grow, and I tried to play uh, around the world as much as I could. You know, I played, uh, but I, you know, played in Australia almost almost every year. I went to Japan quite a bit. Uh, I played, uh, uh, obviously, played the British Open. I always ended up picking up some other European tournament of some kind. So I did try to play a little bit around the world uh, to be able to to grow the game. It's the same same as I'm in my design business. I when uh, when we start having the opportunity to be able to go to places like when South Africa opened up and when Russia opened up, China opened up, places I thought that the game was going to grow, I wanted to be part of the growth of the game and around the world. It's not just a U.S. game, it's a world game. You know, Jack, it, it, you mentioned the period where you thought you could still win. Mid-80s to late-80s, did you sense this level of globalization as far as depth from South Africa and Australia and obviously all the excellence in Europe? Greg became a real force in the States, but did you sense it would be this strong 20 years out? Well, I've, I've always felt that the game will uh, continue to grow more outside the United States than in the United States, and obviously that's going to mean more good players coming from around the world than from the U.S. The uh, U.S. Uh, has good players. There's no question about that. They've got a lot of great players. And a lot of great kids. You know, I've captained uh, uh, a couple of Ryder Cups and four Presidents Cups, and and you know, every time I've had those kids on the team, they all try, they all work, they're all talented, they're all they're all great kids. It, it brings them together, and you see that the teams that come in from uh, in the Ryder Cup, and you see the teams that come in in the Presidents Cup, those players are getting better and better and better and better. And of course, it's it's very difficult for the U.S. to dominate, and uh, so they don't dominate anymore. But it's. Uh, uh, we're still competitive, and uh, and uh, as long as we keep working at it, I think it, the competitions are great. Jack, we keep seeing in the monitor all the different shots and the crowd running at you, and the different events and the different just the the different memories of, of your career. What what memory or event crosses your mind most often? What event? 
crosses my mind most yeah. often. I don't know. I suppose from a plane standpoint, probably the 86 Masters. Uh, from a crowd standpoint, probably uh, well, the 86 Masters obviously was one that was pretty good. Actually, the 98 Masters went terrible. But the uh, uh, the 80, 80 uh, U.S. Open at Baldus Roll and maybe the 78 British Open at uh, St. Andrews. I mean, the crowds were absolutely wild. And, you know, I had the New York crowd at the 80 U.S. Open, and, you know, you had to sort of watch yourself going from green to tea because everybody was slapping you on the back and go, go get them, go do this, you know. You're afraid you're going to get somebody that's going to actually, you know, knock you down or something. And then the British Open, of course, uh, at St. Andrews, they keep, you off the go- they keep them off the golf course until the 18th hole. And then coming up the 18th hole is, you know, you try, you got to figure out how you're going to find your caddy and how you're going to find your golf ball. It's, uh, it, was, it, was, it was pandemonium, but it was, uh, it was a great experience. The people were hanging out to the roofs, and, uh, uh, you know, what, what, a, what a great experience to have that happen to you in a lifetime. It's, uh, if it happens to you once, it's fantastic. I had it happen a few times, and it was just uh, spectacular every time. We are joined and continue to be joined by Jack Nicholas. kind enough to give us his time. He is headed to Hawaii next week for the Champions Skins game. And, and Jack, as far as the design end of things, the economy here, we just did a, did a little business report. The economy in the United States has been struggling. For your business, which has got over 300 golf courses worldwide, what is the best emerging market for your design business? Well, I don't think there's any question that it's China right now. And I think we have um, uh, like 14, 14 or 15 golf courses under construction in China. Actually, I've got, I've got 18 people on my design staff in, in China right now. That are that are based there, and you know I only basically only have a, have about two or three here in the United States, and uh, those guys travel mostly to do work outside the United States, but 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 you know need to work out of this office. So uh, you know from a business standpoint, uh, uh, China, Russia, uh, I think I've got we've got four golf courses under construction in Moscow right now. Uh, we've got uh, several proposals in the, in the, in the South America, but nothing's really happening too much. We've got one under construction in, in Argentina, and uh, hopefully we'll have some in Brazil, because Brazil, because of the Olympics, has really uh, uh, sort of sprouted with interest. And uh, Korea has been a big market. Uh, uh, Southeast Asia is, is still there. Uh, Australia, oddly enough, has come back and to be a pretty good market. I've got four projects in Australia right now. So it's uh, – it's, we're fortunate. We uh, – sort of positioned ourselves to be worldwide a few years ago. So when, and then when the economy sort of really fell apart here in the United States, we had the ability to be able to uh, uh, take advantage of what's happening worldwide. You started with China there, and I've never had the, the privilege of, of going to China. And you said this is the biggest of the emerging markets. What can this be from a golf perspective in, say, 20 years? Well, there's uh, over 300, pe- 300 million people in, the, in what they call the middle class in China. And, you know, if you've got a, a population uh, as big as the United States in just the middle class uh, who have, who have uh, you know, spendable income to be able to have the opportunity to, to learn the game of golf, you're going to learn A lot of people are going to learn it. Um, the, uh, I've got one client over there who has uh, donated a lot of money to the China Golf Association to uh, build a golf course and a teaching facility in each province of China. And, you know, that's a lot of work. We're doing all that with him. And that is, uh, that's a big undertaking to start with. But he wants to grow the game over there. And so we want to be part of the growth. Uh, when South Africa came through uh, and, 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 and apartheid was uh, uh, abolished, I wanted to be part of New South Africa. We've done, you know, six or seven, eight golf courses, whatever it's been in, in, in South Africa. Uh, South Africa is slow right now. But there's a lot of places that keep changing. Korea has still been very, very uh, bullish on the game. Uh, of course, obviously, you know we've got a lot of women women players that are playing on the, on the LPGA, and of course, obviously, you've got uh, guys that are playing the, with Yang and uh, and, and Choi on on the, on the major tour, and they'll and they'll have more. So, you know, the game just is growing, and it's uh, uh, but China is 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 the is, is a, the real place because it's just uh, they just want to they they want to do what we do. You also mentioned South America, and that's where the Olympic Games will be held next time around. 
uh, or in, in 2016, and golf will be part of the Olympics in the near future down in South America. If you were, if the Olympics had golf in the 60s or the 70s when you were really at your peak, how important would a gold medal have been to you? I mean, would it have been important as a major? Where would it have sort of ranked on your board? Well, you know, I don't know about where it would have ranked from a U.S. player or from a mature market player like a, from, from Great Britain or someplace like that. But uh, for the most of the world, the number one thing that uh, happens in sports is a gold medal in most every country. So when you start to see a population of over, well over a billion people in China, well over a billion people in India, uh, you know, Brazil probably is very similar to what the United States in population. I'm not sure what the population is there. But, um, you know, you've got, you've got places where golf did not exist, but, but gold medals have existed. So uh, the gold medal is going to be a very, very big thing. And, you know, in, in, from, from my standpoint, obviously the, the, the major championships would have been the big thing. But if we'd have had the gold medal and with the rest of the world having the opportunity to compete against that, I think the gold medal would have been something that I would have really, really liked to have had. Um, you know, the, um, the game's growing in, 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 in Brazil with, with going, the Olympics going there in 2016. And, you know, we've got to really make a good showing in 2016 because Olympics, Olympics uh, golf will be in the Olympics in 2016, 2020. But they vote in 2017 to whether it's going to continue beyond 2020. Yeah, so just, one, just one crack really at it. Yeah. Year. yeah, they only get one crack at it. That's right. You know, we were seeing footage from 62, still, I think, the greatest road win, so to speak, in golf. You went to Western Pennsylvania, your first major, first professional win. Give us your thoughts about what the USGA is doing as far as the awarding of this national championship to a lot of these municipal golf courses and courses that have access where the public can play. Aaron Hills, Chambers Bay, obviously Torrey Pines, Pinehurst, which I know you're familiar with. Do you like this philosophy? Uh, I think the philosophy is fine. I think they need to mix it up. Uh, you know, I think it's uh, I think it's a great. It, it is our national championship. It isn't our private championship. And I think they said I think that's good. But I, I think there are there are private clubs which have a history uh, that uh, have, have uh, hosted the U.S. Open quite well. And I don't think you should forget about those. But some of the new golf courses where they have public facilities. And you mentioned Pinehurst, of course, which I played played Pinehurst. Uh, uh, I don't know Chambers Bay, but I know that they, I understand it's got a good reputation. Uh, um, Torrey Pines, of course, has been redone, and and that, that is obviously a public facility. Pebble Beach has public access. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of golf courses that uh, uh, fall into the category that can host quite well. Well, Beth Page is another one, and uh, so uh, I, I don't see anything wrong with it. Matter of fact, I, I support it. And by the way, we sent out the call that people could send in questions for you at morningdriveatgolfchannel.com. And by the way, they can go to your particular site, which is nicholas.com. And one of the questions came from Jim and said, are there any rules of golf that you feel should be changed? Well, probably the whole whole book of uh, uh, the rules of golf should be changed. I think, uh, you know, if you try to figure it out, uh, it should be common sense. Yet common sense never seems to prevail, and they're so complicated nobody really knows uh, what it was. I had a fellow the other day at the USGA rules official said that uh, he said it was much more difficult to uh, pass the test to be a rules official than it was to pass the bar exam, and <laughs> and so uh, there's no reason for that. I mean the game should be simple. People should be able to understand the rules, and it should be just rules should be common sense. Uh, the one rule in the game of golf that I've always thought was the one that I didn't like uh, was out of bounds. All out of bounds means is you didn't own the property. And does that mean it should be a two-stroke penalty? with well, stroke and distance, but should that be a two-stroke penalty, or is that uh, uh, you know that's twice as that's twice as bad as, as whipping a golf ball? So you know I, I'm not I'm not sure. There's some rules that are that 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 are that are, that are unusual. But uh, for, the, for the most part, the rules of, the, of golf have uh, uh, kept the integrity of the game. It's the only game where a fellow does, obviously, uh, call rules on himself. And it's, uh, you know, golf, golf has stayed sort of above all, all, all the problems. So uh, hopefully it'll stay that way. You know, you uh, attend all these youth activities because you, you got a clan of uh, grandchildren that are very, very active. Are parents today 
basically the same as the way that your your parents were when you were a kid as far as the way that they support their kids and grandkids, or, or is it different now? Well, I think it's totally different. I think it's pro- the problem we have with the game of golf. Uh, you know, today you've got Little League football, Little League basketball, Little League baseball, lacrosse, soccer, uh, what have you. I mean, they're, they're, And every Saturday and Sunday, generally speaking, it's taken up with these sports, and, and, and the young people are not playing the game of golf. And they're not playing it because they're spending time with their kids. I think it's great they're spending time with their kids. It's great that they're involved in kids' activities, but they're, they're a little too much. You know, I'm... I know my. I had two of my uh, grandkids, or maybe maybe it's three actually. Three of my grandkids played in a, a lacrosse tournament in Tampa over New Year's. They played New Year's Eve, New Year's Day, and the day after New Year's. And the parents obviously had were over there with them. So you know what kind of a life do they have for, other than going to the kids' games? And they and they have these kids specializing at eight, nine, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years old when they really need to be developing their. Uh, their skills of getting along with, pe- with 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 each other and doing other things other than just spending all their time playing a, a sport. Um, you know, maybe that's what they want to do. The kids love it, so I can't, I, I shouldn't complain about it. But we didn't. We obviously didn't have that in our day. Uh, we had the ability to do a lot of different things and, and pick and choose what you wanted. And uh, I guess the kids can still pick and choose what they want today. But it's a uh, it's a little too much specialization at too young of an age, and I think golf is suffering from that. And uh, unless unless we really get into into little league golf, where it really gets more into the masses rather than uh, uh, than being too specialized with uh, just the specific golf courses. Uh, along those lines, this uh, this question from Chris: What are some tips junior golfers could use to improve and be prepared for the college level? Anything specific? Well, I don't know anything other than play, uh, <laughs> play and get in competition. I mean, that's, uh, you know, I mean, I played all sports when I was a kid, and uh, but when I got when I wanted to get ready for something, whether it was a, a basketball game, I prepared by practicing and working at it. It's no different than golf. You, pre- you prepared by going out and practicing and playing and getting against the the best competition you get into, and uh, uh, you know, go after it. Where's your grandson going to college? We need the scoop. Why don't you, you can announce it right here. It's all right. I can't announce it. But I think he will. I think he'll probably announce it this week. Oh, and, is that right? Uh, Nick is uh, Nick O'Leary is yep. you're talking about. And Nick is uh, Nick is quite an athlete. About six four and a half and about two thirty. And uh, every college in the country has uh, recruited him from a standpoint. He's uh, he, he, he as a tight end, but he's you know he plays tight end or he really he he, he uh, splits out more than anything else and. Uh, uh, he's, a, he's a terrific receiver, but he also he throws the ball well. He punts. He returns punts. He, you know, he does pretty much anything, and he blocks beautifully. So um, he, he'll be a he'll be a uh, he'll he'll take a lot of kids with him to wherever he goes. Well, you know what? We're showing footage of you dotting the eye. What did that feel like? Well, I was as I walked out there. I've been in front of you know twenty thousand, but never a hundred thousand. And I was wearing. I hope I didn't trip over a white line going out there. <laughs> Thank you very much for being with us. It really is a pleasure to have you on our program. (laughs) My pleasure, guys. Come back and visit us soon. That is Jack Nicholas.